looking good and you are feeling good today, man. Do you all realize how blessed you are with this worship here every week? I mean, do you know? It, it is such a blessing to be here in church. Uh, the worship has been so good all week long and the services last night at six and this morning at nine. This really is, I, I know some of you don't believe this, but this is about as close to heaven as you're gonna get before you get there. It's not over there at Walmart. It's, it's, right, it's right here. Um, and it's always amazing how some people don't wanna be here. I, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. If you would just stop what you're doing and get in here, your life would be changed for all of eternity. Amen. Amen. Well, everybody say next weekend. Next weekend, we're handing out the T-shirts, okay? It's got the theme on it for the year, Ambassador for Christ. And uh, I've already been getting texts and phone calls, people saying, hey, I can't be there next week. Can you save them for me? The answer is no. <laughs> it's only for the people who are going to be here next weekend, amen? So we start a brand new series next week on 2 Timothy. Uh, we wrap up a series today, but next weekend we're starting, it kind of goes with the new series where we're going to go through a book in the Bible, 2 Timothy. So make sure you read through 2 Timothy, and please bring your Bibles uh, with you as we ask each and every week. And in a couple of weeks, there's a thing there in your uh, bulletin. We're having an informational meeting on going to uh, Israel. This is a picture from over in Israel. Uh, we're doing some teaching somewhere. I'm trying to think where that is exactly, but it's somewhere over there. I think it's right outside of... Jerusalem is what I think, but um, uh, there's brochures out in the lobby, uh, but in two weeks, we're having an informational meeting if you want to come and uh, learn more about that. Six weeks, my last announcement, our revival starts October 15th through 19th, and uh, we're, we're, asking, we're asking you to be here each and every night. Uh, we just, it just don't want you to pick and choose. Just be here every night and just have an open heart uh, to what God has in store because God is the one that puts this together and he's the one that's got the word uh, for our hearts. Amen? I want you to take your Bibles today and turn to Luke chapter five. Luke. Everybody say Luke. Luke was a doctor. Luke chapter five. And uh, we are in this series. We're wrapping it up, 30 Minutes with Jesus. How many of you have enjoyed this series? You've enjoyed the series so far? This is, the last, this is the last sermon in this series. Jesus and the unpopular man, Jesus and the sinner, Jesus and the unfaithful friend, last weekend, Jesus and the hopeless man, and today, I want to talk to you about Jesus and the diamond in the rough. The diamond in the rough. There's, a bull, there's an outline inside your bulletin. Please take that out and take some notes if you would. How many of you ready? How many of you ready today? All right. If you ever get to go with us to Israel, we spend about three days of that trip on this lake that's on the screen behind me. This lake is called the Sea of Galilee. It's up in northern Israel, and it's, it's unincorporated, if you know what that means. It looks the same, it feels the same, it is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on this lake and ministered near this lake. It was on this lake, and this is actually the northwest corner of the lake where Jesus spent most of his time. It was here at this part of the lake that Jesus called and chose 12 disciples. It was here that he spent most of the three and a half years of his ministry. It was on this and near this lake that he performed most of his miracles. And of those 12 disciples that he selected on this lake, near this lake, I wanna to talk to you about a man named Peter. Peter was one of the 12. Everybody say Peter. Peter. I want to spend a few minutes before I get into the meat and heart of this message. I want to give you just a little bit of the background and the bio of Peter. And I want you to write this down. Number one, he, he was a fisherman. He fished for a living. 
Peter grew up on this lake that you're looking at. It's where he grew up. And I don't know if you really know a fisherman, a true fisherman. How many of you know a true fisherman? You know a true fisherman. Not someone who goes out once every 12 years, but someone who likes to fish. Fishermen are notorious liars. <laughs> They'll tell you they caught a fish this big. Now, it was actually this big. But they said, man, I caught a fish about this big. There was a plaque in a, in a barber shop, and the plaque read, the only time a fisherman tells the truth is when he calls another fisherman a liar. <laughs> and I had a fisherman tell me, he told me this one time, he said, Dudley, I caught a fish so big that the picture of the fish weighed 11 pounds. He said that to me. <laughs> Luke chapter 5, verse 2 tells us in the text that Peter was a fisherman, grew up on this lake. And I'm sure that he looked like a fisherman. I'm sure he talked like a fisherman. And I'm sure he smelled like a fisherman. Number two, write this down. He was uneducated. He didn't have a college degree, never went to college. He was unschooled. Didn't have any of these fancy letters after his name. Just an ordinary man. He would never make it to the cover of People Magazine, ever. Just a guy next door type of guy. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God can choose and use anyone. If you read through the Bible, God usually chose someone who was less than normal. I, 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 it's never been about your degree or, or your abilities but it's always about your availability. And Peter was available. Now, besides being an uneducated fisherman, write this down, number three, Peter was always saying the wrong thing. Always. He kind of lived by this motto. His motto was open mouth, insert foot. But if you study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's amazing how often he speaks without really thinking about what he's saying. Billy Graham once told the story of a Sunday school teacher who was teaching a Sunday school class, and this teacher had a classroom full of young boys, ornery boys, and she asked the class, how many of you boys would like to go to heaven one day? And all the boys raised their hand except one boy named Charlie over in the corner. She said, Charlie, you don't want to go to heaven? And Charlie said, well, I want to go. I'm just not sure I want to go with all these guys. That, that's a little like Peter. Peter was a little obnoxious, a little bold, a little brash. He would always talk first and think later, but he was always saying something he probably shouldn't be saying. Now, another thing about Peter, this is important to note. Write this down. This is important, for, very important. He was very relatable. He's the one person that we can all relate to because Peter... He would take three steps forward in his walk with God, and then he would always take two steps backwards. The next thing you'd see, he'd take three steps forward. Now, he's making some progress, but he always take two steps backwards. Heading in the right direction, but sometimes you'd think, man, this is the greatest disciple ever. And then he'd go back, you'd say, man, that's the worst disciple of the 12. Now, how many of you can relate to someone like that? You know, Solomon, had 700 wives. I can't relate to that. I can't even relate. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You said it, not me. Abraham became a father when he was 100 years old. I can't relate to that. Noah survived a worldwide flood. He and his family were the lone survivors on the entire planet. I can't relate to that. Moses led 1.5 million Hebrews out of slavery into, the, uh, into Israel. You think about, you think about uh, 
Uh, that'd be like me going to the San Fernando Valley. There's about two million people. And I say to the whole valley, everybody get your stuff and follow me. We're going to go for 40 years. We're going to go walk around the desert. I can't relate to him. I can't relate to Jonah being in the belly of a well for three days. But Peter, Peter was always saying something he shouldn't say and always doing something he shouldn't do. How many of you can relate to Peter? Oh, that's us. Now here's the fifth thing about Peter's bio, write this down. It's amazing, it's amazing. He's the first disciple that Jesus calls. Jesus is getting ready to start a worldwide ministry where he's gonna implement his kingdom here on earth. And he looks on the entire planet and the very first person, he says, I'm gonna choose this guy to start, it's Peter. And in this story in Luke chapter five, now most of you know this story. Peter was a fisherman, he grew up on this lake. In Luke chapter five, he'd been fishing all night long and they hadn't caught a single fish, not even a little minnow. And Jesus shows up, says, Peter, I want you to take your boat, let's go back out, we're gonna throw our nets down on the other side of the boat. Peter looks at the Lord and says, Lord, you're nuts, you're crazy. What do you know about fishing? I'm the fisherman, you're a carpenter. I don't tell you how to build houses, why are you telling me how to fish? And the Lord says, Peter, let's go out there and cast these nets on the other side of the boat. And Peter had this little thing, he said, okay, all right. I'll do it just because you asked me to. They go back out there, they throw their nets on the other side of the boat. You know how this story goes. They catch so many fish. The Bible says it's not just that the nets began to break. The Bible says that the boats began to sink. They had so many fish. Now that's a great fishing trip. And at the end of that story in Luke chapter five, in verse 10, Jesus goes to Simon Peter and says, Simon, don't be afraid from now on, from this moment forward. I showed you how to catch these fish. I helped you. You and I, we're gonna change the entire world. And in verse 11, the Bible says, they pulled their boats up on the shore, they left everything and they followed Jesus. Even though Peter's uneducated, and even though he's always saying the wrong thing, and even though he's stumbling at every step, every tip, step that he takes, and even though he's probably a, a very smelly, foul-mouthed fisherman, he's the first disciple that Jesus calls. He says, come follow me. Peter, he says, I know you think you're good at fishing. You're not even good at fishing. You didn't catch a thing all night. But follow me, and you and I will uh, make a difference in the kingdom of God. Peter accepts this invitation. He leaves everything. He follows Jesus. And then he emerges as one of the leading characters in the entire New Testament. He's mentioned 83 times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's mentioned 71 times in the book of Acts. And he's mentioned 11 times throughout the rest of the New Testament. So that's his background and that's his bio. Now, in the, the heart of this message, I, I, I want to talk about what happens in Peter's life, what happens in his life before the resurrection, and what happens in his life after the resurrection. Everybody say before. Everybody say after. Uh, what we're going to see is that in this, this uneducated, ordinary fisherman, we're going to see a huge transformation that takes place in his life after the resurrection. It's night and day. He goes from being a nobody to being a somebody. He goes from being a stumbler to being a builder. He goes from being a sinner to a saint. He goes from being ordinary to extraordinary. He goes from being a pebble to being a rock in the kingdom of God, amen? amen. Now one of the blessings, y'all want a blessing? One of the blessings of studying this transformation in his life is the conclusion that we will come to, that if God can use someone like Peter, then God certainly can use someone like us. 
So often we are guilty, I'm guilty, you're guilty of thinking God could never use someone like me. I'm not talented enough, I'm not gifted enough, I've made too many mistakes in my life, I'm unqualified, I'm too ordinary, I've got too many flaws, why I'm the last person God would ever want on his team. And what you're gonna see today That if God saw the potential in Peter, that God sees the potential in you. You're going to see that if God saw Peter as a diamond in the rough, that God sees you as a diamond in the rough. Today, you're going to see three transformations in the life of Peter. This colorful, flawed character, the most unlikely to succeed character in all the Bible that God uses to lead a worldwide mission for Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Number one, before the resurrection, he's a swearing, foul mouthed individual. But after the resurrection, he becomes a preacher, a dynamic preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 26. Everybody say the word before. Say it again. This is before. uh, We're going to say before and after a lot uh, today. But uh, but it's just to help you to realize where we are. I want to go before the resurrection. Jesus has just been arrested. He hasn't died yet. He hasn't been buried yet. Of course, he hasn't resurrected yet. This is before all that. Jesus has been resurrected. Here's how the story goes. Verse 69, Matthew 26, 69. Peter was sitting out in the... The Marriott (laughs) Courtyard. And a little girl, a little girl, a servant girl, came to him. Said, you, you, you were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. Verse 70, but he denied it before them all. He said very clearly, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Now, don't forget, fishermen are liars. I want everybody to say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Say it. That's Peter. He spent three and a half years walking next to Jesus, and when a little girl comes up, he says, I, oh, I don't know the guy. Verse 71. Then he goes out to the gate. There's another, it's, a, it's just a little teenage girl. Didn't even say to him, she was just talking to some other people. She pointed over to Peter, and she said, you see that fellow over there? He was, I saw him. He was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72. He denied it again with an oath. I swear, I promise. I don't know the man. Everybody said again. Liar, liar, pants on fire. He's a liar. Verse 73. After a little while longer, those standing there, they went over to Peter. They kind of confront him. Is it Peter? It's down in Jerusalem. Peter, you're like one of those hillbillies up there in Galilee. You're like, you're like a country bumpkin. We recognize, we recognize your what? Well, you, got an, you, don't, you don't talk like you're from the city. You talk like you're from out in the country. And, and Peter goes, y'all, y'all don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Verse 74, he began to call down c- curses on himself. 
and he swore, I don't know the man. Everybody say it again. Liar, liar, pants off. This guy's a liar, chronic liar. And at that moment, Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times, and he went outside, and the Bible says that he wept bitterly. And at that moment, when he was weeping, he was weeping because he knew that he had disappointed Jesus, because he had made a promise to Jesus that he would die even if he needed to, defending him. I mean, this guy is messed up and stumbling everything he says and everything. That's before. Now, let's go after. Everybody say after. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. I want you to see this in your Bible. Oh, Acts chapter 2. This is after. Say after again. Verse 14, this is called the day of Pentecost. If you know anything about what's happening here contextually, in Acts 2, verse 5, it's a Jewish holiday. And the Bible says these words in Acts 2, verse 5, that in Jerusalem on this day, that every Jew under the sun had come to Jerusalem for the feast of the, of, of the, the Pentecost feast. All right, are you with me? This isn't him standing next to a little teenage girl out at the fire pit at the Marriott Courtyard. This is center stage, Jerusalem. Every Jew under the sun had gathered. And the Bible says in Acts 2 verse uh, 14 that Peter stood up with the 11. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd and he begins to preach. And this is one of the greatest sermons that have ever been preached. I can't read it to you because of time. At the end of the sermon, verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, he says. The promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Verse 40, and with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Oh, what a transformation. What a transformation. He goes from cursing, cursing and swearing at a little girl now he's preaching boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes from swearing to soul winning. He goes from a, a, having a potty mouth to being a proclaimer that Jesus is Lord. What an amazing turnaround. Now we know, we know, we know that out of this heart, out of this heart, out of this heart, the mouth speaks. So how did this happen? I'll explain it. God changed Peter's heart. And if God changed Peter's heart, he can change any heart in this room here today. If you'll simply ask him to come in there, he'll change it. True faith leads to true transformation. Some of you've never been transformed. It's because you, you don't have true faith. Because if you have true faith in Jesus and in the death, burial, and the resurrection, he will transform your heart. And if your heart is transformed, your speech will be transformed. Here's Peter, instead of swearing up a storm, now he's preaching up a storm. 3,000 folks get saved, and the New Testament church begins with the fresh moving of the Spirit of God. And if that can happen in Peter's life, it can happen in anybody's life here today. <laughs> Number two. Write this down. He goes from slashing to ministering. Oh, that's a big difference. He goes from fighting and slashing to serving. Now, in your notes there, going to after the resurrection, we just read from Acts chapter 2. 
And in your notes, you'll see there that in Acts chapter 2, he's preaching. The very next chapter in the book of Acts, this is after, everybody say after, this is after the resurrection. In chapter 3, he's ministering, he's serving, he's healing, helping people be healed. Let's read the story. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says that one day Peter and John were going up to the what? The to the temple to do what? Pray. To pray. Now listen, this is about 100 yards, about from here to in and out Burger. From where before the resurrection, he cursed and denied that he knew the Lord. This is like a hundred yards from the temple. Now he goes to the temple, and it says at, two, at verse 2, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where this man was placed every day to beg from those going in and out of the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, moolah. Peter looked straight at him, and as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Peter said these words in verse 6, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him get up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and the man jumped to his feet. He began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, and he was walking, and he was jumping, and he was praising God. Verse 9, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him. Why? This is that same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Peter just didn't get on a box and preach about Jesus. Now, in chapter 3 of the book of Acts, he's now serving. He's now ministering. He's now healing in the name of Jesus. It's not just words. It's in his deeds. Don't forget, he is one of the 12. He had been given apostolic power. But God used Peter in a mighty way to serve and to minister throughout all of Jerusalem because all of Jerusalem heard this story. What's amazing, if you flash back, everybody say flashback, if you go back before the resurrection, the guy that curses and denies that he knows the Lord before the resurrection, John 18, 10 says these words, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, he drew it, and he struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his left or right ear. His right ear, sh- chopped it off. And the Bible says the servant's name is Malchus. Now, I don't want you to think that before the resurrection that Peter was a swordsman. He's not a swordsman, he's a fisherman. And he's not trying to cut off Malchus's right ear. There's his left, there's his right. No, he had this sword. They had just arrested Jesus. He's trying to cut Malchus's head off, and he goes like this, and Malchus ducks at the last second and cuts his ear off. And the reason the Bible tells us Malchus's name is in case you don't believe this, hap- this story happened, they said his name is Malchus. If you don't believe this, go ask Malchus. Malchus will tell you. Peter cut this ear off. Well, how to get back on there? Jesus put it back on. I want you to understand that as you read this story, that it really is the before and after of Peter's life. It's a story of conversion. His, his, he was converted before, before the resurrection. Peter was foul-mouthed. He was a denier, a liar. He was a coward. He was a fighter. He was chopping off the ears of Malchus, a slasher, a destroyer. But after the resurrection, now he's a preacher. He's an evangelist. He's a proclaimer, a healer. Instead of hurting people, as he did before the resurrection, now he's helping people. He's healing people. He's serving people. He's ministering to people. We had a guy in this church, I have his name written down right here, I don't want to say it. But he told me that for years, he used to go to Vegas 
and just go to the clubs in Las Vegas. Now, I've never been in a club, never been in a, Las, a club in Las Vegas. I don't know what goes on there, but I can imagine. And I don't want to ask, show of hands, how many of you have ever been in a club in Las Vegas? I don't want to ask. But he said that was his life. He was a wild, wild guy. And someone gave him a Bible one day. And he said he took the Bible and he put it on his desk at work. And he said that Bible sat there for 10 years. And for 10 years, he, stepped, he kept going to the clubs in Vegas. Back at work, there was a Bible sitting on He never opened it. And one day someone invited him to Shepherd Church and he came to this church and he heard the gospel. God got a hold of his life. He was baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, completely transformed his life. He went back to work and there's that Bible sitting on his desk. And he said, I can't believe that for 10 years the answer to every problem in my life was sitting on my desk and I never even opened it. But that's a story of conversion. And I wanna ask this question, is there anybody here in this room that would give testimony that your life was in shambles and you were messed up and you were not serving the Lord but somehow God got a hold of you and turned your life around and today you're serving him? Is there anyone who can give testimony to that? Number three, oh, get this. His transformation goes from being a fearful per person to being a fearless person. Of all the ways that Peter's life was transformed, for me, this is the most impressive. We read earlier in Matthew's account, we read it, read it verse for verse, and I've listed here Luke's account of what Peter's life was like before the resurrection when he was uh, scared of a little teenage girl who suggested that he was a follower of Jesus. Before the resurrection, he's, he's literally, he's literally fearful. Before the resurrection, he's, he's, he's hiding. He's hiding. He's scared because, because Jesus was arrested and, and he's thinking to himself, well, they arrested Jesus. They're coming after me next. They crucified Jesus on a cross and they're going to come crucify me next. So before the resurrection, he hides because he's scared to death. John chapter 20, how many of you still with me? Jesus dies on that cross, he's buried, three days later he resurrects, but the disciples don't know it. They're in hiding. John, 20, verse 19, again, this is before they know of the resurrection, on the evening of the fir that first day, while the disciples were together, the doors were locked because we're fearful. They got Jesus, they're going to get us next. Where can we hide? Let's go in here. Let's shut the door. Let's not get the lock. Lock it. Lock it. Lock it. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You see, before the resurrection, they were swearing, they were lying, they were denying, they were slashing off Malchus's ear. Now they're hiding, they're scared, they're fearful. But after the resurrection, everybody say the word after. 
After in Acts chapter 2, he's preaching. Acts chapter 3, he's healing and serving and ministering in the name of Jesus. And when you come to Acts chapter 4, this is after the resurrection. Oh, he's fearless. He's fearless. You got to read what I'm about to read. Acts chapter 4. This, this, is, this is, I wish I had time to tell you, show you how unbelievable this is. How many of you still with me? This, this, this is the same, this is the same guy before the resurrection. Little teenage girl, you're one of, oh no, no, I swear, I swear, I swear, I called that, no, I do not know the man. To a little teenage girl. But in Acts chapter 4, after the resurrection, after Jesus walked in and showed him the nail-scarred hands, oh, he's fearless. Because now he thinks, even if they kill me, I'm going to live later. Right? Are you with me? Now pay attention to what happens here. of the temple guard. The Sadducees, they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus this thing called the resurrection of the dead. So verse 3, they seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Verse 4, but many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Verse 5, the next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law, that's the Supreme Court of Israel, they met in Jerusalem. Then you've got this guy named Annas. Verse 6, the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and there are other men of the high priest's family. And verse 7 says they had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, by what power, by what name do you do these things? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, now don't forget, before the resurrection, a little teenage girl. Oh, no, I don't know him. In Acts chapter 4, he's standing before the bigwigs of Israel. They're all listed. And the Bible says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to give an account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and we're asked how he was healed, you want to know how he was healed? Then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone that you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. And then he says these words, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved. And here it is, verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, why, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Oh, write this down. There are two things that can change anyone's life in this room here today. Write this down. Don't lose me. Don't get distracted. There are two things that can change anyone's life here today. Number one, it's the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. When you put your faith and trust in the one who conquered the grave. And at that moment, the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus will place his presence, his spirit, 
It's Jesus. It is Jesus in spirit form will come to live within your heart. And if you ever become a Christian and invite Jesus into your life, your life will never, ever be the same. He will transform your life just like he saw the potential in Peter's life. God sees the potential in your life. Just like God knew, he knew, he knew when he called Peter. Uh, There's a reason why he was the very first disciple that was called and chosen despite all of his flaws. God knew that he was a diamond in the rough, even though that he was a liar and a curser and a denier and he was a fighter and he was in hiding and he was fearful. Yet God knew if I can get a hold of this guy, I'll use him to preach and to serve and to minister and he will be fearless and he will stand before the bigwigs of Israel and he will proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what he did. Do you remember remember how it all started? It all started with this foul-mouthed fisherman, smelled like a fisherman, out in the middle of the lake, hadn't caught a thing. Jesus does a miracle, and he says, Peter, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. I say this to say this. God doesn't necessarily need you to change who you are as much as he needs to change what you care about. If you're here today and you're an educator, you're a teacher, here's what Jesus says to you. He comes to you as an educator and he'll say to you, hey, come and follow me. You're a teacher, come and follow me. I will help you teach eternal truth. Your CPA, financial person sitting out here, Jesus said, hey, come follow me. I'll show you how to get people's lives in balance through the power of the gospel. Are you a doctor, a nurse here today, a surgeon? He says to you, come and follow me, and I will teach you how to lead people to spiritual health. Are you a salesman? You're in sales? Jesus says, hey, you you like to sell? Come follow me. I'll teach you how to, I'll I'll teach you how to sign people up to follow Jesus. Are you a, are you a mechanic? Oh, come follow, you're a mechanic. Come follow me. I'll show you how to fix people's lives. Are you a dentist? Come follow me. I'll teach you how to fill the cavity inside people's heart with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do do you, do you lead a household? Oh, oh, come follow me. I'll teach you how to build the household of God. Don't ever insult Don't ever insult God by saying these words, God, you could never use me. Oh, you are exactly the type of person God wants to use. If only you'll come and put your faith in Jesus, the one who died for your sins, the one who was buried, and the one who three days later resurrected. And once you believe in that, your life will never ever be the same and God will use you to make a difference in this kingdom. Let's stand, let's stand, let's stand. Oh. Honey. Oh, I got so much on my mind, but we gotta pray, but um, I wanna pray for you, I wanna pray for you. You see these doors right over here? You gotta have enough faith to get out of that seat and walk through those doors. God will take your life and turn you into something you never even thought was possible. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this series. I I could study encounters, people who had encounters with Jesus from now until he returns. Because at the end of the day, as we started this message off, Peter's the one guy we all relate to. 
I think it's why we like him so much. Because we've all said things we shouldn't say. We've all done things we shouldn't have done. And yet once Peter came to understand the reality of the death, burial, and resurrection, his life was never the same. He emerges as this, one of the leading pillars of the New Testament church. And it just, it just reminds us that no matter who we are, no matter how many flaws we have, that God, he doesn't necessarily see those flaws as much as he sees the potential that's in us. If only we would come in faith and accept him as our Lord and Savior. This sermon should be encouraging to everyone who's here. So often we come to church, and I, I do this now, I feel bad for the things I've done wrong, but the, the sermon, the sermon, the message is once you encounter Jesus as Lord, that he'll transform you from the inside out. And he's the only one that can change our heart. He's the only one that can transform our heart. We can't, we can't even transform our own heart. Only he can do that when we come and put our faith and trust in him. So if, if there be a man, a woman, a boy, or girl here today, here today who've never trusted you, God, help them just to not leave, but just to come and walk through those doors. We have people waiting to talk with you and pray with you and discuss that decision in your life. You'll never regret it. You'll never look back and go, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, you'll just, you'll be thankful. You'll be thankful that you did it today and you, you might wish you'd done it sooner, but you'll never regret the decision you would make today. If you're watching online, text Jesus to the number on that screen. Lord, bring us back next week as we start a brand new series through 2 Timothy. Help us to bring our Bibles. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. Help us as we leave today to reflect Jesus wherever we go. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you for coming to church.